The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. Missouri Governor Mike Parson appointed Andrew Bailey to be Attorney General in 2022. And since that time, the Republican statewide official has made a lot of headlines on a slew of high-profile initiatives. On the latest episode of Politically Speaking, Bailey sits down and discusses his record in office and explains why Republicans should choose him on August 6th over Will Scharf. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. My promise to St. Louis was that I would do the absolute most for each and every person, starting with those who have the very least. What I wanted to do was look and see what other states are doing. We have to be willing to change those laws that they are balanced and they affect everybody equal. As somebody that grew up in the St. Louis area, in North St. Louis County, I didn't know any lawyers growing up. We gotta find long-term solutions to make government better, but also to be able to provide services to people. I don't wanna leave that federal money that we've been leaving all these years on the table. We need to be spending this money to take care of Missourians. I thought we accomplished a lot this year, but a lot more needs to be done. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent Jason Rosenbaum. Joining me uh, from mid-Missouri, she covers all things state government and state politics for St. Louis Public Radio. Sarah Kellogg. And joining us in St. Louis, he is Missouri's attorney general, and he is seeking a full four-year term on August 6th. Hey, this is uh, Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey. Thank you so much for joining us. As our listeners know, we had uh, Republican Will Scharf on previously, and for equal time, we are bringing on the current occupant of the office. And I'm very glad that there are only two Republicans in this race. <laughs> can we can we interview seven Secretary of State candidates, Sarah? We we deserve a medal and a plaque for that. It's been a little bit too many, but we made it through. Too too many people. <laughs> we have both talked with you many times since you've been appointed, but we have not actually talked about like how you got to this point. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you even became like intertwined or engaged in Missouri politics. Yeah, I grew up in mid-Missouri, uh, went to the University of Missouri on an Army ROTC scholarship in 1999, planned to go to law school. Uh, 9-11 happened. Those plans changed. I volunteered for a combat arms br- branch of service and then volunteered uh, to go to Iraq. And I had the privilege of serving as an armored cavalry scout, platoon leader, executive officer, and ultimately a, a troop commander. And it was a privilege to get to lead soldiers in combat over two deployments to Iraq and uh, taught me a lot about leadership and management skills that I use today at the attorney general's office. Uh, you know, when I took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, was willing to put my life on the line to do it and took that uh, fight to the enemies of freedom in the battlefields and the war on terror. I came home and I actually moved to the city of St. Louis and I worked at the Family Court Juvenile Division as an armed guard while I applied to law school. Went back to Mizzou Law on the post 9-11 GI Bill, so paid for my school and blood, sweat and tears. And it was a privilege to get to do that. Uh, always wanted to be a prosecuting attorney. And so I ended up uh, doing special prosecution at the attorney general's office for a couple of years and eventually settled down in Warren County, Missouri. And uh, I married a, a gal from Texas that I met when I was in the army down there, did prosecution there at the Warren County prosecutor's office and also was the attorney for the county juvenile office where uh, motivated my wife and I to become foster parents. Uh, we've had the, you know, been blessed to have adopted kiddos. And so when you go from no kids to multiple kids overnight, suddenly I started adding up my bills and realized I couldn't afford to be an assistant prosecutor anymore. I went to work at the Missouri Department of Corrections on June 1st, 2018. That's the day Governor Parson took office. And if you think about how he came into office, he didn't have a staff with him. So he had to build that out as he went. And he had to sign and veto bills, make decisions on appointments. And so he saw me work in a DOC, eventually pulled me up to be on his staff. And I I served uh, with Governor Parson for just about four years, happened to be in the right place at the right time when my predecessor, Eric Schmidt, was elected to the United States Senate. Yeah, Parson appointed you to your post in 2022. Why did you want to be a journey general? I care about this state because it's home. 
I care about, uh, you know, the, I got to grow up in a Missouri that enjoyed freedom, safety, prosperity. I want I want my kids, your listeners' kids and grandkids, to, to get to enjoy those things as well. And if we don't have people who are willing to put their uh, names on the line and, and, and stand up in the ring and, and fight back, we're going to lose those things. And I want my kids to be able to enjoy those things. I tell you, every morning uh, when school's in session, I get up and I drive my kids to the bus stop and get to spend a little bit of time with them. And it reminds me and reinvigorates me uh, to do the work that I do. There have been several people involved in Missouri politics who served in either Iraq or Afghanistan. Stephen Weber, who may become the next state senator for Boone County, talked about how that service played a big role in how he viewed the legislature, particularly about how people failed to stand up for their principles. What did your service teach you about elected service? Well, it definitely taught me the value of strong leadership, bold action, uh, decisive action. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I, this is the show me state. Results matter. You know, politicians do a lot of talking. I like to get to work and I like to produce results. And certainly that was what was required of me on the battlefield in Iraq. And if I didn't do my job, people were going to get hurt. And so, you know, taking pride in your work, uh, taking your oath of office seriously and uh, you know, developing real leadership and management sc- skills to rally folks around you and, and what you're doing are really critical uh, to, to my view of this office. You are now engaged in an expensive and pretty acrimonious primary against Will Scharf, who was on Politically Speaking recently. Why should Missouri Republicans choose you instead of him? Well, I'm the only Missourian in the race, and I've got real-life leadership and management skills that I've put uh, demonstrated, put in front of the people of the state over the past 18 months. We've, you know, eliminated the gender mutilation clinics of children. We've uh, fought to remove the Soros-backed prosecutor here in the city of St. Louis that was refusing to do her job. We've increased criminal prosecution statewide by 133 percent. We've won the lawsuit against the Biden administration's refusal to build the border wall in order to fight to make Missouri communities more safe. These are real tangible results. And again, this is the show me state. Results matter. We've been fighting and winning for Missourians since day one, and I'm proud of my record. Your campaign or your allies have derisively dubbed Sharf Wall Street Willie. I think you actually called him that on uh, Scott Fawn's show. So I, I can't I can't say that it was just your allies. It was also you. It's because of the fact that he's from New York and comes from a wealthy family. But what does his place of birth or his family's economic status have anything to do with being attorney general? Well, to put it in perspective, he went to elitist ivory tower, uh, you know, Princeton and Harvard while I was going to Mizzou and then paying for my school and blood, sweat and tears and service to our nation. To put it in further context, during my second deployment to Iraq, while I'm chewing sand uh, for 15 months, he's at Princeton and gets arrested uh, for serving alcohol to minors. And so, you know, there's just a real contrast in the things I've done in my life and my background here in Missouri and his. I don't think he was ever charged with anything for that, though, right? Well, he threatened to sue the police and told everyone that he had a nervous breakdown. Oh, okay. Were you born in Missouri, by the way? I was not born in Missouri, but I grew up here. This is home. Okay. So if you weren't born in Missouri, why are you criticizing the fact that he's not from Missouri? Well, Isn't because, that a bit hypocritical? No, because I grew up with Missouri values in elementary school, junior high, and high school here, and then moved home here when I got out of the Army. And so this is home for me. This is where I'm raising my kids, whereas he showed up here with a bag full of money in order to buy a political office. I may, maybe that maybe this is projection because I get a little uh, defensive about this, too, because I was born and raised in Illinois. But like I chose to move here by choice. And I consider myself a Missourian just as much as Will Scharf does. Like, why does it matter if he made the decision to come here? Well, I think it's the motivation. Again, he showed up here in order to try to obtain a political office because he wants to be a politician. Now, Sharp has made the argument that Jefferson City is too beholden to special interests and lobbyists and that you are part of this problem. What would you say that you are part of these quote unquote establishment that needs to be swept out on August 6th? Well, I'm clearly not part of a political pedigree or an establishment. I ended up in Jefferson City only because uh, I started working with the Missouri Department of Corrections and Governor Parson happened to see me and pulled me up to be on his staff. And so my dedication is to service and service, serving the people of the state of Missouri. Now, before we go on to actual issues, you talked about like an Ivy League pedigree. I mean, Donald Trump graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. Is it is certain people with Ivy League pedigrees better than others? Well, I think the contrast, again, when you look at the Missouri Attorney General's race, uh, you've got somebody who is a father and a veteran who served the people of this state and has a track record or someone from the East Coast that showed up here uh, and is trying to buy a political office. It's just a, a stark contrast. All right. Let's talk about the things that you've done and what you have done. Let's talk about Donald Trump first, since I, I brought up uh, the former president and possible future president. I want to discuss this lawsuit that your office filed against New York about a jury's guilty verdict 
in a case revolving around falsified business records with the former president. Why does Missouri have standing to intervene here? Well, because there's a rogue prosecutor and collusive judiciary in New York that are seeking to take President Trump off the campaign trail. They've done that through an illicit gag order that was not uh, supported by the facts of the law and is unconstitutional. They've done it through specious legal reasoning, a charging document uh, replete with due process violations, uh, and then other errors throughout the trial. And so the, their goal and ambition was never to obtain a legally valid conviction of the president. It was always to take him off the campaign trail, and that harms Missourians. If this case is so wrongly decided, isn't a better venue for it the appeals court in New York? Like, why aren't you confident that if there are so many deficiencies here, it could just go through the regular appeals court process in the state of New York. Well, I'm confident the uh, case will be overturned on appeal because it never should have been brought in the first place. But the normal appeal process for an individual defendant takes 18 to 24 months and is inadequate to redress the grievances that Missourians have in the heat of a presidential campaign. Now, going to the central thesis of this case, you're arguing that the conviction of Trump amounts to election interference and that it deprives Missouri of a choice of, of uh, a true choice of being able to elect Trump again. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to use an extreme hypothetical here. If I announced for president on on January 21st, 2025, and then uh, committed a bunch of crimes, would I just be able to get out of all those crimes for free because I'm you don't want to interfere with Missourians' right to vote on me for president? No, but I don't think that accurately captures the facts that occurred here again because you've got a prosecutor in uh, Manhattan manufacturing charges based on specious legal reasoning and this kind of Rube Goldberg theory of a, an unidentified pres- uh, presidential, uh, excuse me, a predicate offense uh, that forms the basis for the, what he claims are falsified business records. And so the fact that it's so replete with uh, legal and constitutional error undermines and, and uh, the credibility of the conviction and, again, emphasizes the, the, the nature of this endeavor. So if the Supreme Court ends up picking this up and deciding in your favor, do you think it could set a precedent where a state like Illinois could s- just start intervening in our criminal cases? Let's just say they want to, like, overturn every death penalty case because there's no death penalty there. What's to stop that precedent from happening if this is successful? Well, again, this is about a presidential candidate in the heat of a campaign uh, in one of the most consequential elections in this nation's history. And so I think the facts are very different, very distinguishable. And the founding fathers contemplated that there would be disputes amongst the states, and they codified in Article 3, Section 2 of the United States Constitution, a method by which those grievances could seek redress. And so that's what we're doing. If Trump becomes president, what exactly will you do as attorney general to make sure that he's not doing things that interfere with either Missouri's interests or the United States' constitution, especially especially since you are going out on such a limb to defend him? Well, I'm not. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm defending the people of the state of Missouri's right to engage in a presidential election, to hear from a presidential candidate. And I'm always going to fight for the Constitution. I'm always going to fight for the rule of law. And we use this example with uh, Scharf as well. So if Trump announces in 2026 that he's going to run for a third term, are you going to stand up and say, nope, you can't do that. It's against the Constitution. Of course. I mean, I've never seen President Trump take such a, a, a blatant uh, approach to, you know, against the plain text. Now, th- there could be different facts there, right? What if he says we need to repeal the amendment or, you know, right. a- enact different law? And right. So I, That's yeah. totally different than saying I'm just going to run again because I've read the text of that and it is not ambiguous. You cannot serve more than two full, full terms of president uh, as president. But you're right. If you wanted to repeal it and through that process, that's a whole different story. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I believe that the rules of the game matter and that uh, we should be promoting the rules of the game and that, that that's a, it serves rule of law principles. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be right back on Politically Speaking with Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. And we're back on Politically Speaking with Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey. He is one of two Republicans seeking to be attorney general for four years on August 6th. So you alluded to a Soros-funded prosecutor in uh, your preamble, um, and you, you were talking about Kim Gardner who resigned last year, was replaced by Gabe Gore, who is now running unopposed for circuit attorney. That is a much less interesting race than this one. Um, 
Because she resigned, the Quo Warranto, which we talked about extensively in 2023, never really went forward. And I would say that some of your detractors are going to try to say, well, there were other things at play that led to her resignation. It was the legislature saying they were taking things off the table. How impactful do you think your office was for her to resign? She absolutely resigned because of the legal action that I took. She was scheduled to be in court hours before her second resignation uh, and was going to be ordered to sit for deposition to tur- turn over tens of thousands of documents that she didn't want to have to do. And so she absolutely resigned in face of uh, a pending hearing in court on the lawsuit that I filed. The Missouri legislature also had a bill that would have allowed the governor to appoint a special prosecutor in certain areas that met a crime threshold. And at the time, St. Louis was the only one. So it was seen as targeting Kim Gardner. And, you know, she resigned before that bill got a lot of momentum. And that also was kind of alluded to being a reason why she resigned. Do you agree with that at all? Or do you think it was mainly what you were doing? No, because she resigned uh, to stymie Republican efforts to pass cr- a crime bill, but kicked her resignation out past uh, the, you know, the the close of the legislative session. And so we said, well, I'm not dismissing the lawsuit. I haven't, I've not been a party to some deal with her. And if her attorneys want to call us and talk about her resignation, they can certainly do that. They declined to do so. We pushed the lawsuit forward, noticed up her deposition. We're headed to court when she resigned the second time, effective immediately. So again, uh, the, clearly the circumstances indicate that she resigned because of the lawsuit because she was about to be ordered to sit for deposition and have to turn over uh, mountains of discovery. There's been a lot of discussion in the governor's race about going after, quote, liberal prosecutors, but there are arguably more problematic county officials who are Republicans, especially when it comes to rural sheriffs or prosecutors. How aggressive do you plan to be with, quote, warrantos if you're elected to a full four-year term? Well, I think you've seen my office be very aggressive, you know, against public corruption and against uh, those who abuse their power by using the writ of quo warranto to go after local officials. Uh, we, we certainly have done that at least three times since I've been in office and and we'll do it again. And, uh, you know, one would hope that we don't have situations where that becomes a necessity. But when, when, when it does, we're not afraid to act. Another major initiative that you took on was around whether the federal government can control social media companies to delete content. And the Supreme Court ruled against the plaintiffs here, primarily because they argued neither the state nor the five social media users had a standing. Was this a big loss for your office? Yeah, I don't I don't think so, because I think what the court said was that there was uh, coercion, the government coercion uh, that caused censorship on big tech, but that the evidence was limited to the years 2020 and 2021 and that we needed to go back down to the trial court to gain additional evidence to determine whether or not censorship was ongoing. We have every reason to believe it was. The volume of censorship had increased significantly over those years. And in fact, the government had had to design a new bureaucratic system to manage the number of censorship demands. So we have every reason to believe that that censorship enterprise is ongoing and can use uh, the merits discovery process to continue to root it out. Okay, I will admit, um, I did read most of the decision, but I didn't read every word of it. But I did find this quote. So you, you can correct me if this is taking being taken out of context. Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett wrote for the majority, the plaintiffs fail by and large to link their past social media restrictions to the defendant's communications with the platform. Thus, the events of the past do little to help any of the plaintiffs establish standing to seek an injunction to prevent future harm. So in other words, Your office didn't prove in all cases that the communication with the social media companies was determinative to restrict our delete content. Is is, uh, Justice Barrett wrong there? Well, I I think that uh, time will tell because I think that we'll get back down to the trial court and continue to conduct merits discovery. I think one of the things that's lost is the fact that such a small percentage of cases ever get to the United States Supreme Court. And this case was in its preliminary stages. We'd only done preliminary discovery, the tip of the iceberg, in order to get a preliminary injunction. And all she's saying there is that there's not sufficient evidence to warrant the preliminary injunction. But the case doesn't go away. And in fact, that goes on. So another situation you've been involved with is with Media Matters, a left of center Washington, D.C. outlet that's been that's run crosswise with Elon Musk. We've talked about this case extensively. I think it's even on a mini episode of Politically Speaking, so you can listen to the details there. But OK, Sharf basically said that this was basically a publicity stunt and this really didn't amount to substantive legal action. And I want you to be able to respond to that. Yeah, look, the court's going to make a determination in this case, and we feel like uh, we need to. We have a duty as the attorney. I have a duty as the attorney general to ensure that uh, people are contributing to groups like Media Matters that they uh, that the 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 uh, recipient of those donations are, are clearly and concisely indicating where the money is going and how it's being used. And so it's important to protect. Uh, 
Missourians from scams like that. The fact is, you got involved with this after Elon Musk sued Media Matters. So you're clearly supportive of his his position that he that you think that Media Matters like defamed or libeled him. Correct. Well, it's actually not necessarily related to that. I, okay. Uh, and, and in fact, I would have to go back and look at the sequence of events. I'm not aware of when uh, yeah. Elon would have filed his lawsuit, but certainly this was an issue that was brought to our attention. And I think you saw the state of Texas take action. Yeah. And Missouri each take action as uh, well. My question is more about like consumer scams within the universe of X or Twitter, because I go on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it every day and see just so many scammy things involving crypto. I've gotten some not suitable for work DMs that are clearly scams that I'm not going to talk about that because this is a PG show. Is your office going to be less likely to go after those scams, especially if they involve Missourians, because you've gotten involved in this Media Matters case? No, not at all. In fact, we're, we are uh, have a robust consumer protection division that was able to uh, uh, obtain $32 million in settlements and judgments on behalf of defrauded Missouri consumers last year alone. We anticipate doing even more this year. So let's move on to another thing that we talked extensively about. We talked a lot about a lot of different things over these last two years. So you're going to get sick of me. Well, I'm going to get. I'm not (laughs) sick of talking about this because these are very interesting policy discussions. So let's talk about the emergency rules for transgender Missourians, which you proposed. You pulled them. uh, You pulled them back after the legislature passed the ban for minors. I'm just going to ask you because I don't think I've asked you this question. Do you regret? the fact that it included adults, too? No, not at all. That was a rule that was intended to uh, require the providers to give patients information. And since when is it a bad thing for providers to have to give healthcare patients additional information upon which those individuals can make individualized healthcare decisions? Okay, we went back and forth on this the last time we talked about this. I understand it's on the providers, but the fact that like patients would have to do stuff in order to get this treatment means it also affects patients too, right? It certainly does. But again, the idea here is that we're injecting a level of safeguard into into a process and into a practice in order to ensure that, that customers uh, that are consuming those products or those uh, buying those services have all the information they need. We're recording this on Monday, July 8th, kind of for our listeners. And a St. Louis circuit judge ruled Friday that your office has no right to access the unredacted private health information of transgender s- children at Washington University's Transgender Center at St. Louis Children's Hospital. What is your reaction to that decision? Well, I think that uh, we still have a role to play to access those documents. I think we're evaluating the, the court's uh, it, opinion and to determine what uh, appellate remedies need to we need to engage with. I think that ruling is inconsistent with rulings we've gotten at the trial court level and other similar cases. And so we've got to synthesize the law as it comes to this issue and, and continue to fight to, to ensure that the proper systems are in place to protect kids. Shifting a little, but not a lot, uh, Rob Connolly, the owner and chef of the restaurant Bull Rush, closed his restaurant, and he cited you by name and the state's suit seeking medical records for trans Missourians. That was the last straw as his reasons for closing. What do you have to say that some of your decisions, especially the ones concerning transgender Missourians, are driving people out of Missouri? I've never met that individual. I've never eaten at his restaurant, and I have no idea what his uh, time as a chef at that restaurant has to do with my work as the attorney general. One of the arguments that you've made in support of your rules is that things like hormone therapy and puberty blockers are not FDA approved for gender dysphoria. First of all, I want to make sure I'm getting that correct, correct? Yes. Okay. Yet many conservatives that have talked about the FDA over the last two years have talked specifically about using things like ivermectin for COVID-19, which is not only not FDA approved, but the FDA has said, do not use this. So... Is it inconsistent to be using the FDA as a cudgel when you want to go after, you know, puberty blockers and hormone therapy, but then say it's like a woke, awful place if you're talking about COVID-19 vaccines? I'm not saying that you yourself have said this, but certainly a lot of conservatives have. Yeah, I mean, I think the point I'm making here is that the lack of FDA approval for these dangerous, powerful chemicals that are injected into young kids' bodies to forever transform their bodies, the the lack of FDA approval for those practices is one more piece of evidence to demonstrate the lack of, of science and medicine supporting those procedures. You know, I talked with a lot of transgender minors and adults during the emergency rules situation. And I, I understand the whole concept of medicine. Not everybody reacts to every medication correctly, okay? But the vast, vast, vast majority of people I talked to said, 
hormone therapy made them feel better or the possibility of getting gender transition surgery as adults made them feel better. So are these people just wrong? Are, are, are these, are these treat, are this imaginary that these treatments are working for them? Well, I think that, you know, you've got a situation where there's a lack of tracking and re recording for adverse uh, implications from some of the procedures. And the evidence that we have that we put on in our defensive Senate Bill 49 from the detransitioners was, was that, in fact, these were abnormal procedures and were, in fact, harmful. And the detransitioners we've spoken with say the opposite. I mean, but you could say that about any medication. There are probably people that take like Ritalin or Adderall that have bad reactions to it, but it works for 95 percent of the other people. So why using one example of it not working for somebody means that it shouldn't be used for anybody? Well, I think that, the again, you've seen very little medicine or science to back up the procedures that, that for which I, I believe others are advocating for. And I think what you've seen is European countries roll those procedures back because they see the long-term harm. And what we've said all along is that there need to be appropriate safeguards in place to protect Missouri children. With gender-affirming health care, you know, you're right, some of those studies are new and they're getting information on that. So let's say the science comes out, there's more studies that come out, it shows that it is generally good for people that are going through that? Would that be something you would reverse your decision on then? Well, I, you have to look at the science. Again, there's no science or medicine to back it up now, and everything, that, all the indicators we have are pointing in the opposite direction. One of the lingering issues that's followed your office over the past year or so is this extensive sunshine request backlog. Can you explain why it's taken so long to process these requests and what's going to be done to promptly process them going forward? Yeah, we've hired full-time staff to address that issue and are at a breakneck pace getting responses out the door and sending people the records they've requested. And certainly we've uh, dedicated additional resources. In fact, I think we probably used uh, the most resources of, of any AG in recent memory to address that issue and ensure transparency in the office. Uh, you've seen also a record number of requests in coming to our office. And so I don't dictate uh, the demand. The, 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 the constituency does that. And as we receive an increased number of requests, we have to be able to adapt and, and find staff to be able to get the records out the door. And I'm sensitive to the concept of backlogs. I've done a lot of reporting, for example, on the child abuse investigator backlog. And like, I, I understand sometimes you're, you, you enter into a situation where you have a ton of back backdated or, or old request to do. Can you just maybe talk about like, how did this actually manifest itself? Did you just walk into the office one day and you had like three or 400 requests and it's just taken a long time to get it or something like that? Yeah, look, I mean, and I think that you've seen a legacy of excellence from my predecessors that has increased visibility on the office and that has caused more people to have questions and want to see things from the office. And so that's increased the number of requests that the office has received over the past five, six, seven years. Uh, those requests take time. And especially when you have turnover, uh, you've got to hire and train staff to be able to uh, manage that those custodian of records responsibilities. And, and that's what we've done while simultaneously, you know, deploying additional resources to address the issue. I'm taking us out of retrospective land, and let's look forward. If you win a, a full four-year term, what are going to be some of your major priorities over the next four years in office? Yeah, I really want to shore up our uh, consumer protection division and increase consumer protection for all Missourians. I think that the nature of scams has evolved in incredibly. I think that uh, the, the no-call list has uh, changed as well in the sense that that statute, I believe, has not been updated since 2015, and yet the technology being used to perpetrate those scams, especially against seniors, has evolved. And so we need to evolve with it and have the uh, resources in place to protect Missourians. I want to increase criminal prosecution as well. I've traveled circuit by circuit, meeting with prosecutors, sheriffs, and police chiefs. And those relationships have paid dividends. Again, we have seen a 133% increase in requests for my office to assist with trial court level prosecution. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do to continue to fight, fight violent crime across the state. Yeah. And I, that actually transitions neatly into my next question. I think Listeners may not know this, but the attorney general's office needs like permission from local entities to come in and, and try cases for the most part. When we talk about criminal appeals, I believe that is the sole jurisdiction of the attorney general's office. Is your office going to try to like make it easier for for to intervene in some of those cases? Or do you think that the situation you have now between 
local prosecutors in your office is, is the way to go. Well, I think that, uh, you know, that that's a, a function of the structure of our state and local government, the relationship between the two that was codified, uh, you know, centuries ago. And I think that uh, Missouri does it differently. Local control means something different. And so state laws enforced at the county by county level, 114 counties plus the city of St. Louis, so 115 different jurisdictions. But yeah, 100 percent of felony appeals come to my office. And the AG does have original criminal uh, jurisdiction over some limited enumerated cases. And so, you know, where those lines get set is a, a constant conversation between local officials and uh, the legislature, because, again, that's a, an issue that's codified in law. I uh, appreciate the relationships I have with prosecutors and, and sheriffs and police chiefs. And so I think those relationships, again, have paid dividends and we can continue to use the systems that are in place now to increase and effectively deploy resources in the fight against violent crime. If you are attorney general in 2025, it's possible that voters may have approved a measure legalizing abortion. It will be up to the AG's office to defend existing abortion restrictions. Is there any sort of argument you're going to be able to put forward to preserve most of these laws? I mean, I think we got to see what gets across the finish line and what's enacted by the people of the state of Missouri and, and, and go from there. I think it's kind of up in the air because I think that opponents of it have said that it's like going to wipe out every law. Like Jay Ashcroft said that on the Politically Speaking Hour. I think there are others who think it'll wipe out a lot, but not all of them. Um, but again, your office is going to have to defend not just the not just the ban on most abortions, but pretty much every abortion restriction that has ever ever been passed. So what makes you think that your office is going to be able to successfully do this, given the language of the amendment? Well, again, you got to look at what gets across the finish line. But I'll say this. I mean, we uh, it's a difference between lawmaking and law enforcing. And it, again, it's a separation of powers issue between, you know, whether the, the people of the state of Missouri are ena enacting legislation or constitutional amendment or the General Assembly's enacting a statute that the governor then signs into law. And we, we use the tools that are at our disposal and the laws that are on the books. And we've there's been other instances where amendments have passed. And then, you know, through a challenge, portions of those amendments have been carved out through judicial decree. And so it's, a, it's an ongoing process. If the abortion amendment fails and there's a challenge to the legality of IVF in Missouri, does your office plan to defend this procedure? You know, I think that... Uh, Again, we're going to have to look at the laws that are on the books and the the, the will of the General Assembly, because that's the expressed will of the people of the state of Missouri. I think that uh, life begins at conception, but I also think that we need to find ways for everybody who wants to be able to have children to, to, to be able to use uh, the, the systems in place to be able to do that. You are currently on the board of the Missouri Housing Development Commission, which doles out low-income housing tax credits. Your opponent has advocated for getting elected officials off that commission. What do you think of that idea? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think... Uh, it's important that the people's elected representatives, either in the legislature or in the more appropriately in the executive branch, have some kind of oversight over uh, public boards like that. Is there anything you would want to do to alter how low income housing tax credits are issued? Well, I think we should always be looking at ways to get better. And I think that's an evolving marketplace that needs to better serve the people of the state of Missouri. So absolutely, let's let's find ways to improve the, the, the system and the process. Do you have any specific ideas as to what that would look like? You know, it's going to require some additional study. Uh, I think there's some some definite proposals on the board now. Uh, and I think that uh, the staff at MHDC is constantly proposing to the board new and innovative ways to, to for process improvement to serve the clientele. Can you name yeah. just any of those ideas? Well, for instance, the, the way in which uh, rates, uh, the, the rents are fixed, you know, I, there's been some conversation about whether or not that's going to follow the federal model or whether or not, uh, it, you know, those are locked in at the state level. And is there some kind of hybrid system? So that, that's just one of the, the ideas. Yeah, nothing gets me more excited than low income housing tax credit policy. <laughs> and that may seem like a joke, but it's not. I've written extensively about that. So on this show, Sharf basically said that the three state senators are being sued for defamation, that the cases are baseless and they should not be sued. But he would not have, as your office did, decided to represent them in these cases. Can you just explain why your office decided to represent them, given that even Governor Parson has spoken out against that decision? Yeah, look, there's a statute called the Legal Expense Fund that indemnifies state actors for anything that's even remotely in connection with their uh, responsibilities. And so uh, we've defended my office. My predecessors have defended other senators in defamation suits under that statute because at the end of the day, the statute indemnifies them. And so I'm not going to politicize you know, the work that we do uh, to represent a state officials like that. So for example, if Speaker Plocker and his staff ask your office to represent them because he's currently being sued in his a, a, official capacity, he said on the show like he hasn't had a conversation with you about that, you probably would take the same principle since it, it would be 
part of the, his official duties is the reason he's being sued. I mean, again, you got to look at each case in a, in a case-by-case basis and apply the facts to the law. One other thing I would like you to respond to before we get to our closing question. Sharf pointed out how your office withdrew from a case involving gaming machines because a PAC supporting your candidacy took money from companies involved in the case. So I understand you don't have any control over the PAC, even though the PAC is going to be doing ads in support of you. Um, So you could say, don't take that money, and they could just ignore you. So I get that. I want to make that clear to our listeners, too. But like, if I'm a person that wanted to see a case against these machines go forward and the attorney general sitting it out because of a conflict of interest situation, and it's a real conflict of interest, is that really a good public policy outcome for the state? No, and that's a complete mischaracterization of what happened. First of all, we've prosecuted those cases. We've You've seen us use civil nuisance law to go after some of the uh, uh, locations where these machines are being housed and being used and that are causing problems in communities. And what we did in that individual case was we found attorneys that could go in and represent the state of Missouri under our supervision to get the case dismissed because you can't use the civil law to get around a criminal investigation. So it's about the integrity of the law. Do you think that maybe the legislature just needs to act to say these are legal or legal. I know that that is not your sandbox, but it seems like that would make your job a lot easier. I think that absolutely it would make uh, law enforcement and local prosecutors jobs easier as well. I think there needs to be to be some clarity in the law and that's up to the General Assembly. Before we let you go, I'll ask you a very simple question. What do you think is at stake on August 6th? I think the whether or not Missouri's for sale to outside interests. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, look, my opponent is bought and paid for by special interests and dark money groups in D.C., I'm proud that my support comes from here in Missouri and that I'm fighting and winning for Missourians. Well, Mr. Attorney General, thank you so much for coming on our program and allowing the Republican voters of the state to listen to both candidates in an extensive podcasty form to make an appropriate decision. Politically Speaking is a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is part of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. And Mr. Attorney General, how could people find out more about your campaign on the World Wide Web? Yeah, check us out at baileymo.com. That's baileymo.com. Thank you very much. And until next time, so long. Politically Speaking is produced by Sarah Kellogg, Rachel Lipman, and me, Jason Rosenbaum. The show is edited by Fred Ehrlich. Read all of our coverage at stlpr.org. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to Politically Speaking by searching the term Politically Speaking on Apple Podcasts. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking.